To face the Necrons in battle is to stand against death incarnate. It is to know the terror of annihilation at the hands of beings who should be long rotted in their graves. The Necrons' enemies see implacable android revenants rise from their crypts or step from amidst flickering witch lights to destroy all before them. In return, the Necrons see only vermin, interlopers and savages that must be eradicated in order for their mighty dynasties of old to rise again. Once, 60 million years ago, the Necrons' armies might have achieved their galactic conquest with singular efficiency. Yet, aeons of slumber and cold stasis have seen madness creep into the minds of their noble masters, as the stately dance of the stars themselves has scattered and ravaged their worlds. What arises now to reclaim the galaxy is an altogether more twisted race, scattered, factionalized, and riven by an insanity that has transformed many of their number into walking nightmares. The Necrons of the 41st millennium are a dark reflection of their faded glories, yet they are no less deadly for all this. In monstrosity and madness, the Necrons are rendered more terrible than ever before. In Search of Immortality The Necrons are feared across the Imperium and beyond as a race of seemingly immortal android warriors. Dark rumors circulate of ancient tomb complexes rising from beneath the surfaces of settled worlds, of ominous invasion fleets sweeping down from on high, and of inexorable armies crushing all beneath their metallic tread. Yet, the Necrons were not always thus. Most of the galaxy's sentient races know the Necrons only as the terrifying beings they are now. Indeed, it took the Imperium of Mankind many centuries to even recognize them as a coherent Xenos race. The Necrons' ruling nobility were clearly seen to be sentient and ferociously intelligent. However, few amongst them had made any efforts to elaborate upon their origins or motivations to what they consider to be the lesser races. They have simply exterminated them. Yet hints exist even now. In deeply buried xeno-archaeological remnants, in the long memories and hidden lore of the Eldari, and in commonalities of primitive artwork and tribal mythologies, of a race very different to the Necrons known and feared in the 41st millennium. Once, the legend suggests, the Necrons were a flesh and blood race known as the Necrontier. Short-lived and warlike, these beings were obsessed with death, and for all their wondrous technologies and star-spanning empire, were in fact quarrelsome and fractitious. Legends tell that, desperate to unite their people, the Necrons' rulers began a war with the beings known as the Old Ones. It was a war over the secrets of immortality, 
and also a war that the Necrontier could never win. If cogent details of this war in heaven still exist, they do so only in the memories of the Necrons themselves. However, Eldari lore suggests that the Old Ones were the creators of the Webway, the arterial network of ethereal tunnels that still spans the interstices between the warp and real space. Using the webway, the Old Ones drove the Necrontier back on every front. It was in the Necrontier's darkest hour, during the reign of Zarek, last of the Silent Kings, that the Catan, those called the Yngir, came before the Necrontier with an offer of aid. The legends speak of ancient star gods, beings formed from the fundamental energies of the universe, who offered Zarek and his people all they had ever desired, power and immortality. All it would cost was for the Necrontier to ally themselves with the Catan to destroy the hated Old Ones forever. Zarek deliberated long, but in the end he accepted the offer. In doing so, he damned his entire race. Fragments of lore describe what followed. The nightmare process of biotransference that placed the minds of the Necrontier into living metal bodies and transformed them into the Necrons. The price was their souls, devoured by the leering Catan, and for all those but the ruling castes, the obliteration of almost all personality and free will. No more would the Necrons war and politic with one another, for their wills were bound to Zarek's control through cast iron command protocols. Yet the cost of this unity had been monstrous indeed. The legends continue, scattered fragments telling of the defeat of the Old Ones and of how in the moment when the Catan were at their weakest following the titanic conflict, the Necrons took their revenge and shattered the duplicitous star gods. They describe how Zarek saw that his people's time was done, for they could not face the Old One's vengeful servants, the Eldari chief amongst them. It is said that the Silent King commanded his people to inter themselves within the stasis crypts of their tomb cities, there to sleep out the aeons until they could rise again to conquer all. Finally, destroying his command protocols and freeing his race, Zarek took his ship into the intergalactic void to seek whatever solace he might amongst the empty darkness. The Necrons have slept for 60 million years, if the Eldari Book of Mournful Night is to be believed. Now they are waking at last, rising up to take back what was once theirs, and the galaxy trembles before them. The technologies that facilitated the great sleep were so far beyond human comprehension that they might as well have been sorcery. Hyper-intelligent master programs and legions of canoptic slave constructs watched over the Necron tombs as the ages crept past. Despite all this, Manifold disasters beset the slumbering Xenos. Some tomb worlds were plundered by lesser races, or purposely purged 
by vengeful Eldari. Others faced cascaded failures in their stasis crypts, were obliterated by stellar catastrophe or comet strike, or endured such violent tectonic shifts that entire tombs were flooded with molten lava. Even those worlds that survived ended up far from their original positions, scattering the dynastic territories of old and leaving the Necrons fragmented and factionalized. The chronostats of many tomb worlds slipped due to mechanical failure or empiric distortion. Thus, rather than rising up as one across the galaxy, the Necrons have awoken piecemeal. Some emerged from stasis during the days of the Emperor's Great Crusade, while many others slumber still. Nor have the Necrons themselves come through the process unchanged. Corruption has crept into the minds of many, either during the passing ages or while enduring the slow and unsettling process of revivication. Nihilistic madness or mindless stupor claim some, while the personality ingrams of others have been distorted by countless subtle derangements. For all this, many billions of Necrons have already awoken, and trillions more stir. Their noble leaders might, in many cases, be mad, but they have lost none of their arrogant sense of superiority, nor their desire for conquest. Every overlord and pharaon has their own agenda, be it to stockpile and fortify, to raid and destabilize, to send forth imperious envoys, or to begin omnicidal purges of non-Necron life. To other races, the Necron's behavior seems random to the point of insanity. Yet in truth, most are working towards the same core goals. Reconquer the stars they once ruled, and restore to glory whichever dynasty they once belonged to. Most Necron nobles are still traditionalists, cleaving to ancient social and martial forms. They impose rigid hierarchies on their underlings and order and deploy their legions in accordance with, or defiance of, the codes of the Triarch that once governed them all. Most importantly, they still fight for their ancient dynasties. Sawtek, Meferit, Nihiloch, and Ogdebek, these and countless other dynasties make up the splintered Necron race. All are technically united in subservience to the rule of the Silent King. In truth, many believe themselves as far above their rival dynasties as all Necrons believe their species above the lesser races. Dynasties are as likely to fall into conflict as to ally, and countless smaller dynasties have been subsumed into the territories of larger and more powerful conquerors. For all this, more Necrons awaken all the time. As their numbers grow, so too to the dire threats they pose to the galaxy. Now Zarek, last of the Silent Kings, has returned and seeks to unite his people in galactic conquest again. Whispers precede him, 
of a diabolical plan to negate the galaxy-ending threat of chaos and subjugate the lesser races once and for all. With his enemies locked in a war of mutual annihilation and more Necrons rallying to his banner by the day, it may be already too late for any to stop him. The Relentless March Upon countless battlefronts across the galaxy, Necron armies are on the attack. Perceiving little distinction between the servants of the Emperor, the worshippers of the Dark Gods, or the teeming Xenos empires that surround them, imperious Necron nobles send forth their legions to reconquer their interstellar domains by whatever means necessary. The Necrons are best known and feared by their enemies for rising up from beneath their very feet. Countless civilizations have unknowingly settled on worlds that conceal Necron tomb complexes deep beneath the surface. Whether triggered by Chronostat or the tomb's master program detecting intrusive life forms, those hidden sleepers awake. If the threat to the tomb complex is deemed significant, the master program prioritizes revivication of the Necron soldiery and war engines. It wields these assets to the best of its ability, employing their might to augment that of its canoptic slave constructs in defending the tomb. Only when the Necron nobility awake to once again take command of their legions do they go on the offensive. In this moment, the doom of the world's flesh and blood colonists is sealed. The earth splits open in yawning fissures, and oceans drain away as the tomb complex rises inexorably to the surface. The skies darken with seething swarms of canoptic scarabs, and the land glitters with the awakening legions as they advance into battle. Fortifications collapse as the ground heaves beneath them, and android killers claw their way out of the earth to trap their victims within the trespassers' own supposedly impregnable bastions. Should reinforcements rush to the aid of the beleaguered planet, they arrive to find the awakened tomb's terrifying defenses and mighty armies waiting for them. Thus are the lesser races slaughtered and another tomb world secured in the battle for galactic dominance. Were this the only way in which Necrons threaten the planets of the fledgling empires, it would be perilous enough. Yet, time and again, they descend from the heavens to conquer unwary worlds, sometimes appearing to step from thin air into the bloody heat of battle. Such feats are not the sorcery they might appear but rather due to the ingenuity of the cryptex. Part courtly viziers, part master engineers, and part cosmic alchemists, the cryptex wield great influence within Necron society. They possess such a fundamental and far-reaching understanding of the universe's inner workings that, to the lesser races, their abilities appear as witchcraft. No single discipline do the cryptex pursue. Instead, each individual embarks on a course of obsessive study 
into whichever field of arcano-scientific lore most fascinates them. Such decisions are based upon whim, aptitude, and often the obsessive madness caused by their long sleep. Often, a cryptech will also select their field of expertise based upon whatever they believe will render them most powerful within the Necron royal courts, and provide them with the most leverage over their rivals and noble masters. Plasmancers, for example, study the martial application of raw energy. They are aggressive warrior scientists whose bodies crawl with skeins of killing power, and who can annihilate their victims with but a gesture. By comparison, disciplines such as psychomancy or chronomancy are far more subtle. The former plays upon the atavistic fears of all living things, while the latter allows the manipulation of the strings of time itself. There are countless other disciplines, from the master engineering skills of the technomancers to the warping powers of the gravmancers, and the insidious abilities of the penumbramancers. Cryptics are vital not only for their personal abilities. They also construct and maintain the eldritch technologies that allow their masters to launch their conquests in so many terrifying ways. Fleets of tomb ships are one such asset, their drives enabling them to bridge interstellar gulfs almost as quickly as warp travel and in significantly safer fashion. Terrifying sepulchral battleships of immense size, tomb ships can easily duel the greatest void craft of the lesser races. Yet their greatest value is undoubtedly in spearheading Necron planetary conquests. Should even a single tomb ship settle in low orbit over an enemy world, it will deploy wave upon wave of war engines against its prey, even as its quantum wormhole technologies open the way for invading Necron foot soldiers to assail the enemy in their millions. Dolmen gates are another means of hyper-technological Necron invasion. They were fashioned during the War in Heaven, when the Catan, known as Niadrazatha, the Burning One, gifted the Necrons with the means of their construction. These living stone arches trammel spars of the webway, allowing the Necrons the capability to travel through them. The metallic warriors must be swift, for even subjugated, the semi-sentient network resists and will destroy the Necrons if it can. Such risks prove worthwhile, however. Surprise is total when the lesser races find ancient, long-forgotten ruins flaring suddenly to life upon their worlds, and the deathless Necron legions marching from within. Eldritch Artifice The Necrons possess a technological base so far in advance of any of the galaxy's other inhabitants that only the artifice of the Eldari warrants even close comparison. This is perhaps unsurprising for a species whose very living forms are mechanical in nature. 
Certainly, it seems natural enough to the Necron nobility themselves, for it supports their arrogant presumption of superiority over the despised lesser races. Most widespread of all the Necron's weapons of war is Goss technology. From the manned portable Goss flares borne by Necron warriors up to the massive Goss flux arc, these weapons all function in the same fashion. They project a molecular disassembling beam that reduces flesh, armor, and bone to their constituent atoms one agonizing layer at a time. Goss is but one of the horrifying technologies the Necrons employ in battle. Tesla weaponry releases beams of living lightning that scorches and blasts victims and can even arc from one foe to the next. Particle weapons work by emitting streams of minuscule antimatter particles. These detonate on contact with other matter, annihilating their targets in violent blast. In mitic weaponry, too, is as frightening as it is effective, for its thrumming pulses cause the target's atoms to be violently repelled from one another to spectacular effect. Heavier firepower is provided by such armaments as doomsday weapons or variants of fearsome death ray. Doomsday weapons are plasma-based and possess incredible destructive potential. They are so power-hungry that entire platforms have been developed to facilitate their deployment. Death rays, meanwhile, pour immense energies through a focusing crystal, unleashing a sustained beam of blinding, searing heat and light that carves through targets one after another. While the Necrons typically favor overwhelming ranged firepower as a statement of contempt for the foe, the close quarter weapons borne by their more elite or murderous warriors are no less deadly. Hyperphase weaponry vibrates across multiple dimensional states, allowing it to pass through a target's defenses without resistance. Void blades work in a similar fashion, but cause their victims' very molecular bonds to collapse at the slightest touch. Some weapons are as much status symbols as they are potent tools of destruction. The Staff of Light serves both as an energized battle scepter and a fearsome short-ranged energy weapon. War scythes, typically carried only by Necron nobility or their Lich Guard protectors, project ethereal energy fields around their tremendously heavy blades. Each swing carves through even the toughest targets as though they were not there. The Cryptex do not restrict themselves to offensive technologies. Their skills extend to the creation and maintenance of countless other strange devices, all of which benefit the Necron legions on the battlefield. One such technology is quantum shielding. Harnessing the strength of incoming attacks, quantum shields transform that power into harmless equivalent energy. 
they actually become more effective the stronger the enemy's weaponry. Scarcely less of a bulwark is the dispersion shield borne by retinues of Lich Guard. Towering and heavy, it includes layered energy shield generators that not only stop incoming projectiles, but sometimes ricochet them straight back at the foe. Teleportation technologies are much seen amongst Necron armies, typically employing captive wormholes that allow their phalanxes to march straight into battle from the depths of their tombs, or even from the surfaces of far distant worlds. The Eternity Gate of the Monolith can even be reversed to create a portal of exile that drags in screaming foes, jettisoning them into purgatorial nothingness beyond reality itself. Coupled with gravitic repulsion generators, which enable anything from infantry to massive war engines to glide smoothly through the air at considerable speeds. It is not hard to see why Necron armies are far more strategically agile than their warriors' rigid gates would suggest. Technology has also allowed the Necrons to enslave other entities to their will. Some of these were brought into being specifically to serve the needs of their creators, while others were subjugated for all eternity for their crimes against the Necron race. Canoptic constructs proliferate through Necron tomb complexes and armies both. Some are large and powerful, such as the Canoptic Doomstalkers that guard their master's armories or the canoptic spiders that command and control scarabs and other lesser drones. Others have stranger functions, such as the ghostly canoptic wraiths, employed to repair inaccessible systems within tomb complexes, or the canoptic plasmacytes, that isolate and siphon off corrupted ingrams from the sleepers within stasis crypts. These latter have been co-opted by the deranged warriors of the destroyer cults who actually seek to have those same ingrammatic patterns injected into themselves so as to further degrade their former personalities and fuel their nihilistic butchery. Regardless, no canoptic being is truly sentient. Rather, they are all artificial slaves, utterly incapable of independent thought. The Catan shards suffer a far worse fate, for they were once the star gods of near limitless power who tricked the Necron tier into bartering away their souls. Zarek's revenge upon these beings saw them shattered by weapons that employed incredible cosmic energies. Yet, the Catan were bound to reality itself and could never be destroyed, only splintered into stunted echoes of their former might. Each such shard is still terrifyingly powerful, however, and so the Necrons bound them into extra-dimensional prisons known as Tesseract Labyrinths. When deploying Catan as weapons upon the battlefield, the Cryptex ensure they are technologically shackled, leashed like mindless beasts and forced to do their master's bidding. Of course, 
Once in a while, the Catan breaks its straining fetters. At such times, devastating retribution is visited upon the Necrons and their foes alike. Tomb Worlds The armies of the Imperium have encountered Necron Tomb Worlds from one edge of known space to the other. Even still, humanity has discovered but a fragment of the dynastic territories in which the galaxy was once divided. The Necron's worlds are scattered now, many isolated or beset, yet every single one is a mighty stronghold in its own right. None but the Necrons now remember the glory of their star-spanning dynasties from before the Great Sleep. Yet, there is little doubt that their holdings have been much abused and eroded in the sixty million years since. When the Silent King ordered his people into their millennial torpor, he did everything he could to protect them. The Necron cities were converted specifically for the purposes of sustaining and protecting their inhabitants as they slept through the ages. They could not have been better defended or more technologically prepared for their ordeal. Still, the fundamental forces of the galaxy resist stagnation and the Aeons have not been kind. Some tomb worlds were exposed to cosmic phenomena of overwhelming power, be they the explosive deaths of stars, the thunderous impact of huge asteroids, or even the insidious touch of empiric overspill. Plunged into frozen darkness, Scorched to bone-dry deserts, irradiated, wrenched, and torn by gravitic forces, and blanketed in energy storms. These fates, and many besides, beset tomb worlds and left them inimical to organic life. Of course, such conditions were of little consequence to the Necrons whose android bodies required none of the fundamentals that flesh and blood creatures did. Indeed, dynasties such as the Nefrek or the Thokt even harnessed and benefited from such deadly conditions. Other tomb worlds have known the expansion of teeming biospheres. Some remain verdant even after the tomb below awakens. The Necron nobility considering the organic flora and fauna a useful camouflage for their fortifications. More often, especially in the case of tomb worlds settled by sentient species, the Necrons swiftly conquer and harvest all that they find on the planet's surface. The Awakening legions emerge to find anything from seas of crops to bustling quarries, towering fortifications to sprawling cityscapes, or furious war zones where the lesser races tear at one another, unaware of the doom their conflict has awoken from beneath their feet. Whatever a tomb world's nature or conditions, once the sleepers arise, its fate is irrevocably altered. Land masses shudder, and huge subterranean tomb cities stir beneath the surface. Vast structures force their way upward, slowing off the devastated remains of more youthful civilizations amidst eruptions of magma 
and seething energy storms. Eerie megastructures ascend into the heavens, ominous guardians taking up watchful stations above the planet as cosmic superweapons flare to life in their flanks. When the command is given by Noble or Cryptek, swarms of canoptic constructs sweep across the globe, devouring and recycling the works of younger races in order to raise monolithic monuments to their arisen masters. Any trace of the intervening millennia is swept away as the Necrons resume rulership of their domains of old. Before the Great Sleep, the worlds of each Necron dynasty were ordered and designed according to a strict hierarchical system. Planets were qualified as crown worlds, core worlds, or fringe worlds, with each title bearing significant connotations. At the heart of each dynasty lay its crown world, where the ruling pharaoh sat upon their throne. Crown worlds were as heavily fortified as they were regally magnificent many playing hosts to incredible megastructures and devices or weapons of godlike power. Each dynasty's resources flowed in towards its crown world, ensuring its legions were the finest and mightiest, as benefited the personal soldiery of the pharaoh themselves. Core worlds made up the inner planets of each dynasty, typically ruled by prominent overlords, they were centers for military might and architectural grandeur that bespoke their dynasty's power. Then there were fringe worlds, those planets furthest from the light of the crown world, and thus considered of least import. Fringe worlds were little more than resource gathering centers and border fortresses, and as such, their rule was given over to each dynasty's lesser Necron lords. However, where once there was order, now there is chaos. Galactic drift and stellar catastrophe has wrought mayhem amidst the once orderly Necron dynasties. There is much confusion amongst the awakening nobility, but also opportunity for those able to seize it. Some crown worlds have been shorn of their vassal worlds and are forced to fall back upon their own means. In other cases, Fringe worlds were housed to find their former betters annihilated. In such cases, one time lords named themselves pharaons and seized control of all the resources and dynastic might they consider their due. Some tomb worlds awaken to bounties of raw materials and those able to conquer pre-existing advanced civilizations revel in their bloody harvest. Then there are those worlds that awaken to madness. Some lie within the bounds of roiling warp storms and must fend off constant demonic assault. Others wake even as they are being overrun by superior enemy forces, their nobility afforded just enough time to comprehend the horror of their fate before it is sealed. Worst of all, though, are the severed worlds, planets where failures in revivication have left the Necrons as mindless shells, puppeted in a hollow parody of existence 
by master programs that can never relinquish control to their damned masters. The Pharaon's Legions Every Necron world is organized to strict dynastic codes, from the glittering nobility who rule to the mighty legions that march out to enforce their master's wills. Rare indeed is the tomb world that breaks from this rigid martial order. Every tomb world is governed by its ruling noble, be they Pharaon, Overlord, or Lord. These rulers are surrounded by their royal court, an assemblage of lesser nobles. Nemesaurs who command the royal legions, royal wardens who serve as lieutenants and bodyguards, menacing retinues of lichguard and scheming knots of cryptic viziers. Much politicking and intrigue goes on in these courts, for most Necrons who retained personalities after biotransference remained both ambitious and ruthless. Most Necron rulers find the best way to promote unity amongst their vassals is to set them against a common foe. When the legions march to war, these determined and knowledgeable leaders become valuable assets to their liege lords. Lesser nobles make regal battlefield commanders. Royal wardens act as lieutenants, varguards, or even diplomatic envoys while Cryptex keep the dynastic legions on the march and unleash their strange crypto sciences to cripple the enemy and aid their own forces. Another factor keeps the Necron nobility in order, both on and off the battlefield. The Triarch Praetorians, hands of the Silent King stand as arbiters of the ancient dynastic codes, apart from the structure of the tomb worlds. The Praetorians possess the Triarch-given right to pass judgment upon the honor and conduct of all, even ruling pharaons. Normally, though, they restrict themselves to the battlefield, where they hang suspended by their gravity displacement packs as battle commences. From their vantage point, they assess the conduct of the foe. In rare cases, they may deem an enemy truly sentient and thus deserving of the ancient codes of honor. In such circumstances, frustrated Necron nobles find themselves forbidden from deploying dishonorable assets such as death marks, X marks destroyers, and flayed ones. More often than not, however, they deem the enemy little better than vermin and descend to join in their extermination. Most Necron legions are built around a core of phalanx upon phalanx of Necron warriors. Neurally stunted and grindingly obedient, warriors are spent freely by their uncaring masters. Most nobles are more concerned that their warriors' adornments display their leader's status than they are with keeping these peons safe from enemy attacks. The warrior phalanxes require constant direction. Without this, 
it can manage little more than to hold position and shoot at nearby foes. Properly directed, however, their firepower and resilience make warrior phalanxes ideal for pinning the enemy in place, grinding them into dust, or blunting their most furious counteroffenses. Most Necron legions supplement their warrior phalanxes with formations of more elite and substantially more self-aware soldiery. From bands of tough and tactically independent immortals to sharpshooting deathmark assassins, and hurtling swarms of tomb blade attack speeders. The dynasties can draw upon a range of strategically specialized military assets to lend their legions the edge in battle. Necron nobles make no secret of the fact that they consider the vehicles of their capacious armories to be more precious than the Necrons who pilot them, or indeed the foot soldiers who march to battle in the war engine's shadow. The Necrons are a people who have always equated their vast technological superiority with an undeniable right to dominate. Every cosmically powered weapon and reality warping engine is a statement that the Pharons possess the power to trammel stars and shatter gods. Thus, is the armory of each tomb world not only a concerted display of each ruler's martial might, wealth, and status, but also a material manifestation of their right as supreme being to create and destroy whatever and however they see fit. Some elements of their armies are held in contempt by Necron nobles, such as canoptic slave constructs or Catan shards that are imprisoned as weapons or power sources. Yet there are other sects in Necron society that take to the battlefield alongside the legions, but who the nobility have little, if any, command over. Foremost amongst these are the destroyer cults. While many strains of insanity have afflicted the Necrons, the nihilistic murder madness of the destroyers has proven pernicious and increasingly widespread. Destroyers eschew all notion of personal ambition, desire, or hope, instead descending into a pit of cold and calculated hatred that sees them seek the eradication of all organic life. There are many subcults, from the locust with their grav sled bodies and heavy firepower to the blade-armed Scorpec, or the debased subterranean Ophidian, that share one common demand of the cryptex, which is to have their bodies altered into whatever form they believe optimal for the slaughter of all living things. The Necron nobles employ destroyers as shock troops, However, they do not trust them. Not only do many fear the destroyer's madness to be infectious, but they wonder whom they will turn upon when all organic victims are slain. The flayed ones, too, are feared and reviled by the rest of Necron society. 
exiled to languish in the horrific nether realm known as the Bone Kingdom of Drazak, they are afflicted with the hideous death curse of the Catan known as Landugor the Flayer. Twisted in body and mind, flayed ones are drawn to the scent of blood, scissoring open the flesh of reality and spilling through from their ghastly realm to fall upon the Necron's foes. The dynastic legions make every effort to avoid these beings, whose madness they fear as catching, but they can do little to stop the flayed ones from joining battles that are already underway. The Silent King, Supreme Ruler of the Necron Dynasties. Last of the Silent Kings, Shatterer of the Star Gods, Defeater of the Old Ones, Bringer of Unity, Master of the Final Triarch, Wielder of the Scepter of Eternal Glory. These are but a handful of the grand titles earned by Zarek, the ruler of the Necron race. His endless honorifics paint a glorious picture, but in truth, his gleaming image is tainted by an inner darkness few see. Few beings in the galaxy possess the might, wisdom, and sweeping vision of Zarek, last of the Silent Kings. During the nightmarish transition of biotransference, it was Zarek who emerged with the most powerful and advanced of all the bodies gifted to the newly fashioned Necron race. His neurological and sensory architecture, while wholly synthetic, is more advanced and precise than anything flesh and blood could emulate. His powerful android form is mechanical perfection, on a level that no sentient being now alive could replicate. Smooth and graceful in its every motion, irresistible in its strength, and regal and intimidating in its magnificent presence. Neither mental nor physical ailments can ever afflict the Silent King. His mind remains more wholly his own than any amongst his people, for he was ever their ruler and did not endure the perils of the great sleep or subsequent revivication that have driven so many Necrons mad. For all this, Zarek suffers as he has suffered ever since he realized the purgatory to which he consigned his people. Millennia have heaped upon millennia, and still the Silent King's guilt remains as jagged and bitter within him as it once was. His sorrow and horror have been preserved by his mechanized mind as perfectly as has every single memory, thought, and feeling Zarek has experienced since the day of his biotransference. It can be said with certainty that such an impossible burden as this would have driven even the most resilient of living beings to madness and self-destruction aeons ago. Zarek, though, 
is not truly living, and his torments have not destroyed him. Instead, they have honed him into a being of horrifying and singular determination. The silent king has a plan for his people and for the galaxy, and he knows that he is righteous with the inescapable, unwavering certainty of a god, of a machine. Zarek's will is a star erupting in supernova, a comet colliding with a doomed world. He is as inevitable as time and tide. The Silent King seeks nothing less than final atonement for the fate to which he consigned his race, and none shall be permitted to stand in his way. Zarek was not always so singular in his obsession. When the end of the war in heaven came and the last of the Catan had been shattered, he recognized that his people could not withstand further conflict. The allies and servants of the old ones were circling, wary but vengeful and so he ordered the great sleep. Zarek envisioned a future where the enemies would be defeated by strife and time. Necrons would arise unsuspected from their long sleep. They would seize control of the galaxy using their deathless bodies and cosmic weapons. And then... Freed from conflict and unshackled from the ravages of time and mortality, they would at last devise a way to reverse biotransference and therefore expunge Zarek's sins. The Silent King would not share this in his process, however. For himself, Zarek chose exile aboard his vast city-sized warship, Song of Oblivion. Zorik took many of his own dynasty with him into the intergalactic void. Entombed within stasis crypts of their own, but awakening in regular cycles to crew and garrison his vast ship. None amongst the dynasties truly know what the Silent King sought beyond the stars. Detractors like Emotec or Zarathusa the Ineffable claim he fled with no more intent than to escape his crimes. Others, Pharon Asmanthep of the Zarkon dynasty and the royal court of Nihilok not least among them, believe he had a greater purpose. Perhaps, some speculate, Zarek even sought a cure for biotransference in the lightless realms beyond the galactic rim. Maybe he intended to travel to other galaxies entirely and there find the solution to his people's woes. None but Zarek himself knows the truth, and, as with many of the more troubling mysteries surrounding the Silent King, his race find themselves unable to recall whether they themselves ever knew the answer. From which dynasty did Zarek originally hail? What characterized his rule before biotransference? When precisely did he return to the galaxy, and for how long did he operate from the shadows before openly declaring his return? Even beings like Oricon the Diviner, who was once Zarek's court astrologer, find strange gaps in their artificial memories 
concerning such things. More unsettling still, they rarely seem able to focus on these doubts long enough to seek any answers. For all the gaps in recollection that veil elements of Zarek's life, at least his motivation for returning to the galaxy appears straightforward. The silent king abandoned exile to save his people from the menace of the Tyranids. It is said that he encountered dormant hive fleets flowing through the intergalactic darkness towards the galaxy he had left behind, and recognized the perils they represented. What if they devoured all life before the Necrons could reverse biotransference? Worse, what if Zarek's people had already managed their apotheosis just in time to be devoured in turn? Supposedly driven by pure altruism and a desire to not fail his people again, Zarek turned the Song of Oblivion back towards the distant glimmer of the stars he had known so long ago. This story in itself has holes. What did Zarek witness, and on what scale, that so convinced him of this omnipresent peril? How did he chance across encroaching tyranids amidst the near infinite gulfs of space? Questions of pretext and motivation have been raised. However briefly, by the more rebellious amongst the royal courts, and whispers persist that the silent king harbors some other, deeper agenda. Few find themselves able to sustain their doubts for long, however, and for those who do, the Triarch Praetorians are never far behind. Such shadows and whispers soon burn away in the searing light of Zarek's presence. It is said that merely meeting the Silent King in person is to transform even the keenest doubter into a supplicant desperate to do his will. Shortly after revealing himself openly to his people, Zarek chose two pharaons of lesser dynasties who had proven their loyalty through swift service. Subsuming their legions into Zarekon ranks, the silent king elevated Hapthratra the Radiant in Mesophet of the Shadowed Hand to form his new triarch. They became the pharaon of the stars and the pharaoh of the blades, as the ancient codes dictated. Joining Zarek upon his mighty dais of domination, from where they could proclaim the Triarch's will. There are those who have noted how thoroughly the two pharaohs are bound into the dais, how their voices have taken on a new tone of command since their ascension, and how they speak nearly always with perfect synchronicity. But of course, elevation to the final triarch was bound to affect changes upon such minor rulers. And if they seem always to support Zarek's plans without question, those plans were millennia in the laying, after all. Who could honestly suggest amendments to such a comprehensive scheme? The martial might of the final triarch, at least, is beyond question. Xerix's dais is empowered by a caged shard of Nyadrazatha himself while the Silent King's mantle 
is formed from the Catan's flinced necrodermis. It is the Burning One's own fire that Zarek amplifies through his regal scepter of eternal glory, sending it blazing forth in searing beams of absolute destruction. That same energy is channeled into the potent carrier wave generators of the dais that coordinate and motivate nearby Necron soldiery, and also in the Noctilith beacons held high above Zarek's throne. These beacons not only banish the infernal energies of the warp, but also allow the Silent King to tear open the invisible skeins of the webway, fashioning his own temporary dolmen gates to bear him swiftly across vast interstellar gulfs. Those foes not erased by Zarek's energy blasts are far from safe. While Hapthatra unleashes flurries of neutron orbs from the Staff of Stars, Mesophet hefts a scythe of dust, every swing of its glimmering blade reducing victims to swirling clouds of scorched particles. Enemies who get close enough to strike at Zarek directly are forced to their knees by the thrumming energies of his dais's obeisance generators. Even those blows that manage to hit home are unlikely to do harm. The Silent King and his companions are swathed in transtemporal fields that scatter the force of the foe's attacks and thus dissipates them harmlessly. All the while, a pair of triarchal minhirs orbits Zarek's dais, proclaiming the triarch's omnipotent might even as they channel the dais's power. By focusing the resonance of these devices, Zarek can unleash a devastating annihilator beam an energy weapon so potent that it has been likened to the hurled spear of an enraged god. None who feel its wrath live to tell the tale. <laughs>